do you hold as a possibility that Christ could have visited Central America, but that the Book of Mormon maybe took place somewhere else? And what they found on the inside is perhaps the greatest discovery that we've ever made among the Maya world. Because at the end, we're going to throw some hardball questions at you sure. too, because you know that's what people want to hear. Kukul Khan is descending through the underworld, speaking the words of eternal life. It's very remote to get in there, and um, we're going to go there. We're going to go oh, there. Oh yeah, there you go. So but you're taking us. Yeah, though, absolutely. So. <laughs> See, all of these symbols do connect together, and we're only beginning to understand that. The archaeological evidences left behind are also speaking to us from the dust to testify that these were real people who not only had faith in Christ, but many of them were eyewitnesses too, and who knew him personally and left those testimonies behind in stone. Hey, what's up guys? It's the Paul Brothers here and you better be ready for a crazy interview because today we are going to talk about evidences of Jesus Christ visiting the Maya people. Now this sounds crazy and if you are not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or you don't believe in the Book of Mormon, you're still going to want to stick around because some of the evidences here talking about how Christ could have visited the Maya people and healed them and that that story has been passed down through archaeology for thousands of years. It's very compelling. So stick around because we had the opportunity to interview a guy by the name of Mike Handy and his geographical theory kind of encompasses the Yucatan Peninsula, right? And so we're going to get, we don't get too much into that, but we do talk about the evidences of Christ. Hopefully you saw our previous interview that we did with a man by the name of Wayne May. He believes that the Book of Mormon happened solely in North America, unlike our interviewee today that believes the Book of Mormon happened in the Yucatan Peninsula. And so on this channel, we're not putting forth our own opinions, but we want to present all of the geographic theories so that you have the material to make a decision for yourself. And at the end of the day, engage with the text to come out with your own conclusions. Last time we didn't give a proper shout out to Wayne May uh, of how you can find him and his content. He has two magazines here, uh, one called The Land of Promise, Uncovering Ancient America, and the other is called Ancient America. Um, you can go subscribe to those. It's called Ancient American, but it's okay. Subscribe to mm -hmm. them. Yeah. And Mr. Handy, who we're interviewing today, he's promoting a book called Finding Christ While on the Trail of the Three Brothers. You can buy that online as well. Both of the links to both of these things are going to be in the description. I ask you to just open them up, both of them, read the arguments on either side, and start asking the question yourself, where did the Book of Mormon happen? Because it's going to be in that that you find a stronger faith in Jesus Christ. And so we appreciate you guys watching this channel. Please subscribe. And if you want to support us financially because you appreciate this content and it takes a lot of time and effort to put it together, then please support us through either Venmo or you can subscribe to us on Patreon. We appreciate you and enjoy the interview. Welcome to another video on the Stick of Joseph YouTube channel. In this video uh, interview series, me and Hayden have the awesome opportunity to sit down with many people that have dedicated a significant amount of their lives to finding evidences of the Book of Mormon in several different geographical locations. Uh, today we have the opportunity to sit down with a man by the name of Mike Handy, uh, who has gone about finding these evidences in a very unique and different way that we haven't seen from anyone else and so and he's brought some of them back it looks like in his, <laughs> in his place a few replicas yes are those this is that the sword of laban right there <laughs> that sword actually uh was purchased by my grandfather in a los angeles pawn shop my grandmother in the 1960s wrote a book of mormon pageant okay. that was performed at the hollywood bowl in los angeles yeah. and that was the sword of laban that was used in oh really yeah. Yes, no in way. that Book of Mormon pageant That's back super in the cool. 60s. So that middle one, the one in the middle there, or which which one? Oh, oh yes, yes. It's it's there's this a one. couple well, the different. One yeah, because the other ones are Narnia. The other one is <laughs> from Narnia. Narnia yes. And then we got the witches one from Narnia. That's cool. That's right. That's awesome. Oh, but yes, but so. this sword here, uh, the one in the middle, yeah, has a lot of significance oh. to my family because cool. of that Book of Mormon pageant. That's awesome. And uh, cool. Yeah. Well, Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself. How you got into discovering these evidences? How you guys have approached it? and just kind of your background. Yeah. Certainly. Uh, yeah, once again, my name is Mike Handy. 
uh, our family has been doing uh, Book of Mormon research in archaeology and specifically looking for evidences of Christ uh, for almost 30 years. Uh, it was my aunt and uncle who started this, Keith and Karma Handy, who started doing research into uh, the descending God and of Itzamna and how it relates to the Book of Mormon. And my uncle has written a book, uh, which we have titled Finding Christ While on we the got Trail a copy of... around here, right? Yes. It's called Finding Christ While on the Trail of the Three Brothers. It's over there. I could get another one. I'm going to grab it real quick yeah, so we ahead. can show people it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And then they can, they can buy a copy. Yeah, yeah. Because they're going to want to after this right yes, here. Yes, absolutely. Right yeah. there. Boom. Okay. So, yes, it's called Finding Christ While on the Trail of the Three Brothers. It's self-published. Mm -hmm. uh, it is only available at yucatanrevealed.com mm -hmm. and uh, is the only place that you can purchase copies of it. Say so, Yucatan one more time. Yucatan. There we yeah, go. Say <laughs> that, the is the proper, that is yes, the right. proper way of saying it. Not we'll, Yucatan. We're going to say Yucatan. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, we'll say it properly for this interview. Right. Yucatan, Yucatan. Revealed. So, Y-U-C-A-T-A-N Revealed. Revealed.com is the website. We'll put it in the description so you right. guys can check it out. And, uh, and uh, my uncle asked me uh, to be the illustrator for the book. We have over 100 pages of full-color illustrations, photos that we have taken on our trips uh, through Mesoamerica, specifically in Mexico, in Guatemala, Honduras, and Belize. And, uh, and then I've annotated those so uh, we can... We, demonstrate to the reader what evidences and symbols that they are looking at and how it relates to the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. So that has been our main family project. We do tours uh, to Mexico. Uh, we have two different tours that we do, and we've been doing that for many, many years. And we usually take, uh, you know, 35 to 40 or yeah. so at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, how much time do you think you spent cumulatively down in the Yucatan region? Well, that's, Yucatan a, region. that's a very good question. I mean, as far as the trips that my uncle has made and my aunt have made and, and at it, from research trips to uh, these tours that we conduct. Uh, as far as time, that, that's been difficult to calculate. But as far as in miles traveled, definitely well over 120,000 miles. Yeah. Uh -huh. you know, so, I mean, Probably it's, months and months oh, of time though, oh, all yes, together down yes. there. And, you know, my uncle and aunt, uh, Keith and Karma Handy, they've spent many, many weeks at a time uh, on research trips, uh, going to various different archaeological sites, uh, going to museums, uh, reading books. Uh, and so, it's, yeah, so, yes, an important part of that is the library and reading books and doing research and seeing what other archaeologists have written about or drawn pictures about or taken photo, uh, photographs of. But also it is... got to be out. Out in the field, right? right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, getting out in the field because there have been many very unique things that either have not been documented or new discoveries that are being made all the time. When we're talking about the world of Maya uh, uh, archaeology, we've really only, when I say we've, we're talking about the, the world in general and the archaeology world in general, have really only uncovered approximately three to five percent of the uh, existing Maya world. And, and if you think of it in terms of maybe like a large 60,000 person, you know, football stadium, for example, all we've uncovered is the first couple of seats in the first row. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and you haven't found steel swords yet? Oh my <laughs> goodness <laughs> gracious, Mike. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, the thing is, is, yeah, we can talk about swords, yeah, that's for sure. That's another one. And Mesoamerican swords were not made out of steel. They were made out of wood lined with obsidian. And those were actually much more effective swords than steel as far as cutting, you know, strength and power. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we, we, we could get into a million we things. We could and get into that. Today, today, specifically, because when we had our first meeting uh, like five months ago, me and Jackson walked out of this room right here just like amazed at what we had just heard. I it think was that's kind of the night that a flame was ignited and we just really yeah we've been hungry ourselves. ever since and, and looking into tons of stuff but one thing that's really interesting so the name of your book finding christ on the trail of the three brothers tell us i mean what are these three brothers that you're talking about 
Well, the Maya three brothers were uh, a very strong uh, personalities in, you know, the in the late pre-classic uh, period of the Maya civilization. Their names are in, uh, engraved in many different sites. Late pre-classic. Yeah. What, the, what are we talking well, about? Well, we're talking about we're talking about the period from around, you know, 400 AD or so all the way up to around 1400 AD where they were uh, 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 building cities where they were, uh, I mean, we know they had their hands in various different sites from Chitsan Itza to Akbalam uh, to many other places. Uh, their, their, their names were Kukupekal, Hunpingtok, and Yashuk Kawil. That, that was their names in Maya. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, they had a very close connection with the Maya god Itzamna. Uh, and, and, and we can talk about how that relates also to the descending God. Yes. And so there's so, and, and talking about gods among the Maya, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's well understood that the God, uh, the, the, the Maya had a large, what we refer to as a pantheon of gods, yeah. many different gods, and many archaeologists, anthropologists use them as a very polytheistic, you know, religious society. But much like uh, our society today, even the ancient Maya, there were lots of different sects, there were lots of different cults, there were lots of different religious views and beliefs among the Maya. And and uh, 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 Sir Eric Thompson, who was a very famous British archaeologist, yeah. had noted that what he referred to as the cult of Itzamna, which was a religious sect among the ruling class, mm -hmm. these was his exact words, the ruling class of the Maya, he said, approached monotheism. Mm -hmm. In his view, from what he could see, he said, it appears that those who believed in this cult of Itzamna believed in what appears to be one God. And he, he says, and there's little evidence that we're trying to see about these gods as far as Itzamna. And he also mentions Kukulkan, uh, which uh, is in Maya, means the feathered serpent. Yeah. Many people have heard the uh, Nahuatl uh, rendering of that name, which is Quetzalcoatl. Uh, uh, that's the language of the Aztecs. The, um, uh, Kukulkan Quetzalcoatl was not a god of yeah. the Aztecs. He was a god of the Maya. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Aztecs, though, uh, recognized him as a powerful god of the Maya. Yeah. Uh, but uh, And then he also mentions Sir Eric Thompson's The Solar deity or solar god, which many people refer to as Kenicha Hau. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and he noticed there was a tie between those gods and said, hey, this, this looks like monotheism. Let me uh, cut you off real quick. Yes. So, so what you're kind of saying is here in America, right, we have multiple, the, the main three religions are Judaism, uh, Islam, and Christianity. So you have these three religions, right? Yeah. But if someone went and archaeologically dug up, uh, you know, New York City, for example, which has a plethora of all three of those religions, some people might interpret that, oh, look at they worshiped three different gods, and they had these different interpretations of these gods. What you're saying is that, same with the Mayan, there wasn't like necessarily a uniformity of religion among the Maya people, but there seemed to be different beliefs similar to how there's different beliefs Oh, absolutely. Today. Interesting. Absolutely. Plus, on top of that, more and more research is showing, uh, you know, many of the archaeologists will actually name that this is God A, God B, God C, God D, and they go on, and then they say, well, we can now attach Itzamna to God D, and so yeah. on and so forth, and, 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 and many people are starting to recognize that many of these representations are actually just different representations of the same right. God that are emphasizing different characteristics about that God. Yes. You know, whether it's Kenicha Hau, Kukulkan, uh, Chalk, uh, Itzamna, any of these other ones, uh, it, it appears that they could possibly be the same God, but you're also right. The, the, these same gods could be uh, part of other cults. And, and, and what we have to also understand is much of what we know about the Maya and their religion and the gods that they believed in has been lost. And that is primarily due to the Spanish Inquisition and particularly uh, uh, the day that was known as Acto de Fe, which 
which was Act of Faith, a day that was prescribed by Bishop Diego de Landa, the first bishop of the Yucatan who was sent by the Catholic Church, he uh, believed that uh, the Maya had a God that was similar to Christ. He, I mean, he even wrote in his journals about how the devil has gotten here before us and has sown seeds of false Christianity, and he wanted to destroy, because he believed it was his act of faith, hmm. to be able to destroy <laughs> That's a good any, way of going about right, it, right? any of these references. <laughs> so, Anyone who disagrees with you, just destroy everything they believe. Burn it. Right. Burn it. <laughs> and th and then, you, then they'll believe eventually. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so this, this acto de fe, took, uh, act of faith, took place in the city of Mani. Okay. And they burned and destroyed over 10,000 books and images of this descending Dude, God. Dude, the uh, amazing uh, information that right. was lost on uh, that day. So, uh, Not I a mean, lot of faith building. The Maya wrote on you know, paper books, which we refer to as codexes or codices in yeah. plural, that were accordion folded. Uh, and we only have four in existence today. And that's largely because the Spanish had destroyed so many of them. And there may be still some out there that haven't been discovered. Wow. But but my, my point is, is that much of the Maya culture has been lost wow. due to the Spanish Inquisition, due to the destruction of records, of images, and other things that were considered blasphemous yeah. among uh, the, uh, the, the Spanish and their inquisition. And, and, and it wasn't until decades later that in an attempt to repair the damage, the cultural damage that had been done, uh, 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 there were many Spanish missionaries who worked with Maya elders, particularly those that had flown, uh, fled to the south towards modern day Guatemala uh, and the Quiche Maya, uh, where they, they basically put pen to paper to form what is known as the Popol Vuh, or some people refer to it as the Maya Bible, basically a collection of what had become oral histories and traditions. Uh, uh, but that, once were written down. Yeah, and once were written were down. And there's no question that, you know, that they had become perverted and corrupted over time. It bothers me so bad because you hear about, for example, like the Library of Alexandria over in the Near East, right? right. And just this huge library. And then for some reason, the devil grabs a hold of Christianity. We believe because it's the great apostasy, right? But the devil grabs a hold of Christianity and he starts destroying things that maybe held secrets to the universe and to God that you know, have now been lost to history because, you know, Christianity won their rampage and they destroyed the Library of Alexandria, burned all, burned everything, and then you have the same thing here with the Maya, and it's just, it just makes me sick. And that's the thing that's so hard when it comes to Book of Mormon archaeology is what was left. So, you know, I, I know that you're a proponent of the Central American theory, and we can see how the Spanish really messed things up down there, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to, like, precious metal work and stuff like that. You think that they were just going to leave that alone? Any Because that's one of the biggest criticisms towards the Book of Mormon. Oh, they weren't working with precious metals and making all these things. Well, it's like the Spanish came in and took all of that, smelted it down, got rich off of it, right? But then even in North America, you have, you, you know, so much of the archaeology that was done moving west was just done by farmers who were just destroying things as they went along. And so there's just so much when it comes to trying to find out where the Book of Mormon happened, there's just so much we don't know. And that's why I love your work because it's focusing on something very specific and it has more to do with storytelling and the yes. remnants of archaeology that's left. So let's kind of get into that. What what the the, the stories of Itzamna, of Quetzalcoatl, of all of these of the descending God. Let's kind of get into that. Why why do you believe that these are remnants of the story of Christ visiting in the Book of Mormon? And let's kind of just dive into all that. Yeah, it, well, and let me address, you know, as well, before we get into that, talking about the research and what we know about the Maya. I mean, many people are very familiar with the recent uh, LIDAR surveys that have been done, uh, particularly in the Yucatan, in the northern Paten, in the northern area of Guatemala, where they are flying these planes over the jungle canopy and are using LIDAR laser uh, uh, surveys to be able to effectively in 3D models remove the foliage and discover new cities uh, underneath the, uh, the jungle canopy that has been hidden for centuries. And, and, and that is dramatically changing what we know about the Maya from day to day. I mean, National Geographic has been reporting on this quite a bit. Uh, but uh, so dozens of new cities have been discovered through these LIDAR 
su surveys. But what, what really struck me is watching some of the interviews of some of these uh, top researchers who are involved in these LIDAR projects are saying things like, uh, we are constantly revising the population numbers among the Maya. We never knew they were this populous until we discovered all of these hidden cities in the jungle. And now we're saying, oh, they could possibly be as much as 40 million people at one particular point. The, some of the other things that they, they are discovering, they're discovering more and more roads, which sock bays, as we call them in Mesoamerica, that are cast up roads exactly as they're described in, 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 in exactly in the book of Helaman specifically where they said the roads were cast up and and they're finding more and more of these roads interconnecting cities as well as defensive walls and watchtowers uh, and, and and many of these researchers are saying we now know that the Maya were fighting amongst each other far more than we had ever anticipated, and that warfare was a huge part of the Maya experience in, in, in living life in day to day between these different city states that were constantly fighting amongst each other. Mm -hmm. So those research that research is constantly changing and evolving. There's more and more that's being as, right, mm -hmm. as more information is coming out. Yeah. So, so yes, let's talk about Itzamna, the evidences that we are seeing, and I specifically want to start with a place known as Tulum, mm -hmm. uh, the ancient site of Tulum, uh, which sits right on the Caribbean Ocean. It's the, beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful places ever. Me and my wife is, went there on our honeymoon. Yes, it would is recommend. right. <laughs> Very beautiful place. Mm. Uh, now, the name Tulum itself means walled city, and, and when you enter into the Tulum site, you'll enter in through uh, passages in that wall that is still there. The wall ranges in height from around 9 feet to about 16 feet in various parts, and it's kind of a semicircle because the backside of Tulum uh, you know, are the cliffs that drop straight down to, uh, straight down to the Caribbean. So the thing about we have to understand about Tulum uh, is, first of all, as I mentioned, the name means walled city, but that's not its original name. Its original name was Zama, uh, which, interestingly enough, was referred to in the Black Panther movie. Uh, Black Panther 2, they used the term uh, uh, city of Zama, which is its original name, uh, and, which means city of the dawn. Uh, which which it doesn't it shouldn't be surprising because it sits right, right there the on the ocean. eastern mm -hmm. coast and you see a beautiful sunrise coming up over you know the Caribbean Ocean there so hence the name Zama or City of the Dawn. Now it was never a city where people lived. It was not a dwelling place. It was a temple complex. Think much like our modern Temple Square, where there was a temple and people would go to this place to worship. Uh, the wall around the city was thought for many years to be a defensive wall. However, it it's not very big. No. It, well, yeah, it's I mean, big, nine but... to 16 feet. But the thing is, is that it's only a semicircle. The backside, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, is those cliffs that drop down to the, the Caribbean. But, you know, there are some low points. And so you can approach it from the ocean side and there's no wall there, you know. And so it, uh, many archaeologists have, have rescinded or changed or thought differently that that is not a defensive wall. But it is actually, and you can see this on a plaque at the site of Tulum itself, is that it was actually a wall to keep out the uninitiated who had not been initiated into certain religious right. rites. And so, once again, it was a temple complex. It says there at, at, to, at the that's, site. It's that's right. Like, yes. Uninitiated, and, unendowed, same thing. Right. <laughs> and so, uh, the, the, what we have at Tulum that are some of the most profound images there are the images of the descending god, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, Dios Descendente in Spanish. Uh, now, once again, I, as I mentioned, whenever you find new archaeological finds and new evidences and things to look at at different sites, you'll always, particularly when they're new, you'll get 10 different interpretations of what archaeologists think they might be. As for the descending god, uh, the reason why they call him that, as a matter of fact, I have a depiction right there behind you, Hayden, if you want to pull it out, that wooden plaque right yes, there. Right yeah, this That's is a perfect. typical artist's 
rendering of the descending God, his hands down here at the bottom, we've got his face here, and then his legs are up in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a the descending God, and typically how he was represented. Explain why his fear, I mean, I know it's obvious to us because we talked about this, but for some people, they're like, that's a really weird depiction. Right, exactly, exactly. And, so, and because of that, different interpretations, you get some people calling him the diving God. Mm -hmm. it, look, well, Tulum is right on the ocean. Clearly, he's a God who's diving down into the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, so some people call him the, uh, the, 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 uh, the yeah. diving God. But once again, the primary name, uh, Dios Descendente, or the descending God, because he uh, came down out of heaven. I've also heard him referred to as uh, as the bee god, I mean, uh, or beehive god, because he's almost always depicted as carrying something in his hands. This is an artist's interpretation, and it looks like he has some type of dish that has some type of possibly food in it. I've seen interpretations from different archaeologists saying, oh, well, this is corn. He's bringing corn, and he's tied to the maize god, and he's bringing corn down to the people, or some have interpreted it as bread, but also so I've heard it interpreted as a honeycomb. You know, he's bringing honeycomb down, and then hence he's the bee god, mm -hmm. and he can fly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but once again, he is the descending god is the primary interpretation, and actually most of the depictions of him where he's holding something in his hands is actually a cup. Uh -huh. and, and and that there's is nothing inside it. There's not anything coming out of it. No, yet, no, yet. it's it, it it's it, it's a cup, and 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 that's the way it's depicted at Tulum. However, when you see these images at, of the descending god at Tulum, his hands are broken off, and and you cannot see the cup there. Was it the day of faith? Uh, <laughs> it was related to the, yeah, yes. More faith the yes. The More Spanish faith believed it was blasphemy because they said this is mocking Christ and the Holy Grail. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a God that we know. This is not a God. I mean, he's clearly holding a cup, and and Christ had you know the Holy Grail or the cup that he used at the Last Supper, and so it must be blasphemy. Yeah. And so they would oftentimes smash those arms and the cup that he was holding because once again it was. It it was, it was considered uh, to blaspheme God. Uh, and, but those depictions are there. And, and, and there are three buildings in particular okay. at Tulum where this depiction is made. We have the Temple of the Frescoes, where we see, uh, the, the, if you look at the building, it's actually quite interesting. There are faces on the corners of the building, uh, which we believe are depicting uh, the faces of the three brothers. Uh, but we also have, of a depiction of the descending God, and there's also what looks like intertwined rope connecting him uh, at, at this depict on on this temple of the frescoes, which is oftentimes interpreted as a connecting the descending God to well the connecting faces. the descending God around the building, around the and building. it is often interpreted that that is representing uh, an umbilical cord. Mm. Uh, which uh, the symbol of an umbilical cord is, is providing nourishment, mm -hmm. providing life, yeah. all of those things. And, uh, and, and, and so that, is, that depiction is there. Inside the temple of the frescoes are various uh, different uh, paintings or frescoes on the walls mm -hmm. that depict the three brothers uh, directly meeting and communicating with Itzamna. They're very likely discussing, you know, Tulum. How and Itzamna, to, the descending god. The descending god, the all same. of those things. Now, unfortunately, those frescoes in the Temple of the Frescoes were damaged a number of years ago. Uh, uh, there was a man from Europe who came and uh, was tossing rocks at them because they are exposed to the outside and, and, and chipped off and damaged many of those frescoes what on the weirdo. inside. <laughs> yeah, it, it yes. happens, unfortunately. <laughs> People do strange things. Yeah. Uh, the other places where the descending God is depicted is on the primary grand temple there, which the Spanish referred to as the Castillo or the temple. Uh, many of these sites, pretty much uh, when the Spanish would come in and discover them or look at them, the larger temples they would name the Castillo, because to them it looked like a castle. And, and so they would say, this is the castle here. And that, that primary building there at Tulum 
has three doors up at the top of the steps uh, with three niches uh, cut out above those doors. And on the, if you're facing those doors, there's two statues on the one on the left, the one in the center, and the one on the right is empty. The depiction of the statue on the left is very unique. Uh, it is possibly, as far as I know, the only depiction of the god Hunabku, who is mentioned in the Popol Vuh as the god of God, uh, all gods, the father god. He, in the Popol Vuh, calls a council of the gods to discuss how to create an earth that they can populate it with people. Sounds uh, familiar. He, yes, it's, Have I read the Popol Vuh the, before? <laughs> <laughs> it is very familiar. But this is the only physical depiction of Hunabku that we have ever seen anywhere. Now, it might still be out there somewhere. You know, I mean, as I mentioned, only three to five percent of the entire Maya world has been uncovered. And so, uh, but still, this is unique, you know, that we have a depiction of, he's not only the father God, but he's specifically the father of Itzamna, or the descending God. And right next to him in that center niche is the depiction of the descending God that looks very much like this. And he was at one time, uh, you know, before the hands were smashed, again, holding a cup yeah, uh, there in the center. The, uh, the, you said there the, were three, though. There, was there a, were three. There's another one. So what's the, third in the other one? The third one, as far as we can tell, never had a statue there. It was always empty. The story goes that the Maya intentionally left it empty to represent the god who had no physical form that could not be represented in statue form. Father God, descending God. Right, it certainly <laughs> looks that way. Yeah. A, a, and, and some a imagery that Christians should be familiar with yeah. because it does look like it is depicting a father, a son, and then a, a God uh, who has no body, uh, no body his only spirit. Interesting. Whole, right, yeah. absolutely. Now, and perhaps most importantly, next to that castillo, that grand temple, if, you, if you're off to the left hand or the north side of it, if you're facing those temples, it's to the left, which is the north, is the temple of the descending God. And, and, this, and, and we have that same representation in the doorway. There's just one doorway there, and then there's that depiction of the descending God right above it, and once again, the arms and the hands and the, and the cup is smashed off. But what's really particularly fascinating about this temple of the descending God is the imagery that is used all the way around the outside of the building. There are two pictographs or very simple Maya glyphs, if you will, uh, depicting two different concepts and ideas. Mm -hmm. Just over and over again. Over this. and over again, all the way around the building. And they are specifically an image. It looks like, you know, just a circle or a-, a And we're a, showing the images. We'll show the images. Yes, absolutely. Yes, so you can show this on, the, on your video. We have a circle which is represent, two, actually two concentric circles that represent the sun, okay. uh, which represents light. Mm -hmm. uh, the sun provides light to everything. And then next to it are also another circle, but we have the Maya glyph uh, for water coming out of it. It almost looks like a vessel of water that is being poured out, and you see the water streaming out of the center of the, uh, of the vessel. Now, the idea and concept behind water is life, because it pro water provides life to everything. And so we have these images of light, life, light, life, all the way around, all four sides of the building. So they're clearly trying to say a message about this descending God. Now, this definitely brings in imagery of 3 Nephi chapter 11, where we, we, we hear the voice of the Father. Remember that grand temple, we have that depiction of Hunabku, the, the, the Father God, the God of all gods. Maybe that's why his image is depicted there. And uh, Christ descends down out of heaven, and then he says to the people, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, who the prophets testified would come into the world. And behold, I am the light and the life of the world, and I have drunk out of that bitter cup. The descending God is holding Holding that cup. the bitter cup. Pretty much everything, the imagery that Christ evoked, in 3rd Nephi chapter 11 is depicted on the temple of the descending God, right there. It is very, very fascinating. Now, 
it brings so, tears to my eyes. Like oh. the spirit, like that's just like it's crazy how perfectly it matches what's in the right. Book of Mormon. Absolutely. It is. It really is amazing. Now, now here's the thing. It's so amazing, these powerful images and, and, uh, and, and representations of the descending God at Tulum, that even critics of the Book of Mormon acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, well, yeah, that definitely sure looks like Christ. I mean, we're talking about people who hate the Book of Mormon yeah. and who are trying to, you know, disprove the Book of Mormon. They acknowledge it, those who are intellectually honest, yeah. saying this does look just like Christ from 3 Nephi chapter 11. But their arguments and, and critiques of that are a couple of things. Number one, they say, well, Tulum dates and all these structures dates to the 12th century. That's not Book of Mormon time frame. Yeah. Oh, that's absolutely true. Absolutely. A couple of things that we can do to address that. Number one, uh, like many ancient Maya sites, uh, what we are looking at today as far as ruins were oftentimes built on top of ruins from previous dates. Mm -hmm. uh, and so while most of the structures at Tulum date to the 12th century, uh, archeological evidence it continues to get revised. Uh, I mean, if you look on Wikipedia right now, they're saying, oh, well, actually the earliest, uh, you know, uh, in in engravings that we see at Tulum go all the way back to the fourth century. So they know it's even older than that. However, even newer evidence is showing that the, the, the site at Tulum was populated by the Maya going all the way back into the first and second centuries BC. And so it is a very ancient site. And so the fact that you can c completely dismiss it just because of its date, it, you know, is not... It's not that clear. And for anyone watching who maybe isn't familiar with how carbon dating works or dating sites, like when, when you have a site like that, there's a few ways that people date it. One is they look at the structures and they look at the glyphs on there. And based on the research they've done before, they'll date it that way. And then two is they have to find some sort of biological matter because the only way you can date something is through carbon dating, which with carbon organic with material. organic material. And so the thing that's really hard when it comes to stone structures is they're not organic. Yep. And so the only way that they do it, like for example, the pyramids, they've been dated, um, you know, through dozens, of different, do dozens times. of different Everything times. Everything keeps getting older. And they just keep finding, like what they'll do is they'll climb up on the pyramids and they'll look in between like two of the stones and they'll pull out like an old piece of wood or something like that or, or a different organic material. But that's not a very good way of doing it because you know, throughout the years, different organic material could be introduced to these things through massive storms and, and things like that. And so it's really difficult to date stone structures. And so I think to say, okay, 1200 AD is our best guess is a good way of saying it instead of, oh, it dates to 1200 BC and we are AD and we know for sure. Well, you know as I mean? far as, yes, and I agree with everything you just said there, uh, but also we can date many of the structures pretty accurately because either the structures themselves or stela, which is a freestanding stone that has carvings on it, uh, often uh, it contained Maya glyph blocks and they would oftentimes have Maya calendar dates on mm, them. And the Maya calendar, cool. the Maya had three part primary calendars. Does Tulum have any calendar dates on it? Uh, well, no. They possibly do. I don't know for sure on that, but many of these sites do say, hey, for example, the three brothers, we were known uh, at, here at this date. And, and once again, the Maya had three different calendars, the Hob, the Sulkin, the Long Count calendar, which was incredibly accurate. And so if they say, here's a narrative, this happened on this date, uh, we can pretty much trust that it did happen on that date. Now that doesn't tell us necessarily the construction date of the city, but we know that it was inhabited at that time, and we know that uh, some of those, at least the, the stela and maybe some of those structures, date back to that time. So some of it can be pretty accurate, but other times, yeah, they have to rely on whether it's soil or, or other organics or other things to, to, to try and carbon date or other dating you know, techniques to try and figure out approximately when it was so inhabited. It's, difficult. it's very difficult. But, uh, but also, the fact that it was 
at the t possibly at the 12th century, uh, and and it looks like imagery from the Book of Mormon. A lot of times, you know, even among faithful believers in the Book of Mormon, we make a lot of assumptions about the Book of Mormon that are not necessarily true. Uh, the end of the Book of Mormon narrative talks about this great battle that takes place between really a group of the Nephites and the Lamanites, where uh, the Nephites, or all those who believe in Christ, are gathering together uh, for a last battle at what we know as Camorra, and, and, and we know that everyone in that battle with the, well, at least as far as we know, uh, 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 that was killed except for Moroni, and Moroni says that he's wandering for the safety of his own life because the Lamanites put together, uh, put to death, put to death any Nephite that would not deny the Christ. And so we kind of assume uh, that the Nephites were completely wiped out at that point. First of all, that, that's simply not possible. Mass genocide has taken place in every culture and every society for, you know, the history of the world, but it has never been complete. There's never been a time where a mass genocide took place where they wiped out everybody. That just doesn't happen. So uh, very likely what had happened was uh, Mormon and Moroni's group or city-state or, 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 or sect or belief of Nephites, uh, they were primarily destroyed. But the fact that the, to say that all other Nephites or all other people who believed in Christ were destroyed or killed after 400 AD, I think is a mistake. And so there's quite a bit of evidence to show that there were groups that lived among the Maya who believed in what looked like a type of religious belief that was described in the Book of Mormon. And, and that was definitely perpetuated by these three brothers who were going around teaching about Itzamna. Uh, and, and, and as I mentioned, many, many researchers, archaeologists, uh, anthropologists that initially thought that these three brothers were, you know, fables, were fiction. They were, uh, they were part of the Maya mythology because, well, they're mentioned at 400 AD and they're mentioned all the way at 1400 AD. But a lot of the details surrounding them you know, once again, Kukupakal, Humpingtok, and Yashukawil, their names in Maya, they're showing up here, they're showing up there, at a period of over a thousand years, and they were particularly focused on training men to be what are known as Halach uh, or men of God. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's what the site of, Ch I don't want to get too much of on tangent, but that's what the tangent, that's what the site of uh, Chichen Itza was for. Yeah. Chichen Itza was a training ground. It was a, a type of a Tolan site where they would uh, train men to be Halachi Uniques. And, and the three brothers had a hand in that. Uh, their, their names are on some of the structures there. So, so with that, let me come back to the other criticism by those who are you know, critics of the Book of Mormon and what they're saying about the descending God. Once again, they say Tulum, at, at Tulum, uh, is they agree that the symbology matches up with the Book of Mormon, but they say the dates don't. I, I, I think that's irrelevant because of, you know, what I just explained. The second thing that they like to point out, these critics, is you don't find this imagery of the descending God anywhere outside of Tulum. Uh, that's their criticism. Well, that's not true because people simply aren't looking. First of all, that very same depiction of the descending God with the legs up in the air and, the, and very much like, and the feet are in the hands down below, uh, that, that is depicted at Tulum, we see that exact same representation at a city called Koba which is, you know, a much farther to the south, C-O-B-A, uh, uh, particularly at the top of the temple that is known as Nohachmul. Uh, at the very top of that temple is the descending god. Looks almost exactly like it is at Tulum. So, I mean, it's found other places. Uh, and, and uh, however, so the research that we've been doing, specifically my aunt and uncle Keith and Karma Handy, we have been finding more and more of these representations of the descending god yeah, far, the whole Yucatan. Right, far outside of Tulum. 
Now, one of the more common imagery that we see among the Maya are these depictions of what are referred to as uh, mascarones in, or masks. They call it mascarones in Spanish where you've got these stucco masks that are depicting which most archaeologists are feeling uh, various different gods. Uh, sometimes you get interpretations that they are, you know, Maya kings uh, that, that are being depicted. But the imagery, for the most part, there are certain common elements, and we're seeing it at dozens and dozens of sites throughout Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Belize, all of these places. Now, some of these become more abstract. It's, it's interesting. The farther away you get from the Yucatan, the more abstract these representations become, the, the, the less and less detail. So it can kind of give you an idea. And that, that makes sense with diffusion, you know, and culture spreading out. And, you know, but, but it all seems to be centered there in the Yucatan Peninsula and uh, at where the, the details are extremely clear. All right, so what are the common elements? What do we see? Well, it starts with a very human-like face. Now, the gods among the Maya were oftentimes depicted in anthropomorphic ways, ways that were not human-like, yeah. ways that were trying to emphasize certain characteristics of the god. For example, uh, the god Chak among the Maya, also known as the rain god, is very frequently depicted with a large nose that almost looks like an elephant trunk. Many people refer to him as the hook nose god because the nose comes out and then does a big hook shape out in front. That's an anthropomorphic version of the god. And there are many other representations in that way. However, uh, with these masks, these stucco masks, the center portion of it is a very realistic human face. Uh, with eyes and a nose and a mouth and, and a jawline and it's very, very clear. It's always depicted in the center between two other figures, uh, one on the top that is known as the Maya Earth Monster, uh, and uh, the Earth Monster to the Maya represented the underworld. Uh, so the, hell. Yes, absolutely, hell. And, uh, and, and so the, uh, the Maya, many of them believed that the gateways to these underworlds were in the earth and specifically in, uh, in, 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 in basically big sinkholes, what they refer to as cenotes, where you've got these massive openings in the limestone bed of the Yucatan Peninsula that would lead to massive underground caverns and rivers. The Maya would often believe that those were entrances into the underworld. Hollow Earth. Right? Honestly, right. and if you snorkel in any of them, they look pretty menacing with like all the stalactites or whatever. Oh, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and these are formed through erosion uh, because uh, of the high water table uh, and the fact that the Yucatan Peninsula is just a large limestone plate. And so you get lots of erosion through that. The, the, these cenotes are everywhere and they were sacred among the Maya. But they also had an anthropomorphic you know, depiction of this, which they referred to as the earth monster. It represented hell, the underworld. On the bottom, that was on the top of that human-like face. On the bottom of that depiction is a depiction of the jaguar. Now, to the Maya, the jaguar also referred to him as the Lord of Death. The jaguar was at the top of the food chain. It was the prime predator. It represented physical death, uh, and hence the term the Lord of the Death. And so we have this face that appears to be sandwiched between the earth monster and a jaguar representing both death and hell. And, and, and it appears that this face is coming forward out of the mouth of death and hell. Now, there's one other depiction that, uh, that is very important. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, 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 in most of those representations, the eyes are open okay. and they're very alive. Underneath the nose are two spheres, you know, which sometimes he feels like it looks like a little cotton ball or something yeah. like that. They, th there's a couple of different things we have to note about that. These little spheres underneath the nose uh, were to represent puffs of air. Oh, okay. Uh, to represent like this person alive. Yeah, being alive. It's the breath of life. Mm -hmm. But specifically, if, and particularly when you understand Maya uh, numerals, uh, the, the, the Maya used a vigesimal base system, a uh, base 20. 
you know, number system where they represented dots with uh, numbers one through four, uh, and then they would use a bar to represent the number five, and then you could represent, for example, because it's base 20, you know, the top number in that, it would be, we go from zero to 19. Zero is represented with a shell shape, and 19 would be three bars with four dots, four dots okay. because you got three fives and four dots. Well, those, those, those puffs of air underneath the nostrils of the, in these masks of the human face uh, I, I also looks like the number two, it's two dots. And, and the Maya, as many ancient cultures did, believed strongly in numerology, which means that numbers represent things. And the number two was a con in represented in Maya uh, numerology as the concept of ich, I-K, you pronounce it ich. The ich symbol represented the divine breath that comes from God, uh, and, and hence from the nostrils, directly from the nostrils of God. So once again, it's what we double have, meaning. Right yeah, there. it's a double meaning. Absolutely. It, he's alive, the breath of life, but it's also the concept of ich. So you have this face emerging forth from the death of hell, mouth of uh, death and hell, breath of life in his nostrils. That sounds very much like depictions of the resurrection that we get mm -hmm. from, from the Book of Mormon, from even the Book of Mormon Nephi. Specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was talking in the fifth century BC. Yeah, right, absolutely. Christ will be resurrected one day. Christ, you know, Nephi talks about that quite a bit yeah. in Second Nephi about the resurrection of Christ that would be coming. Now, all of those depictions that show these masks the mascarones, with the breath of life in its nostrils and the eyes open, all date to the A.D. period. We see these same depictions as well in the B.C. period, for example, at the site of Lamanai. Are they the same, though? They are very similar. You have death and hell, but the eyes are closed and there's no spheres under the nostrils. In other words... Our God will die is what, as if they are saying that in the BC period, and He'll and, be swallowed up and swallowed up in death and hell. But in the AD period, where we see his eyes open and his puffs of air underneath his nostrils, as if to say he is alive, he has conquered death and hell. It's Another, crazy. yeah, oh, wow. absolutely. Now, all of these symbols, and I'm going to tie all this in here, the descending God, in a minute. There's also a couple of other symbols about it that are common. Yeah. There are uh, depictions of what square shapes on the sides of the head. Uh, and those, those square shapes sometimes are referred to as earplugs or earrings. Many of the Maya in their culture would wear these ear adornments next to them. And, and they almost always, so in their square shape, and they're almost always depicted with four dots in each of the corners. Now, remember, a dot is the number one in Maya uh, number system. And so, yeah, number four. Well, what did the number four represent to the Maya? It represent in numerology. It represented creation. Uh, think of the four quarters of the earth. It's all encompassing. We have north, south, east, west, the four cardinal uh, directions uh, of the compass. Well, the uh, number four represented once again creation. Uh, and so we have one on, the, on the, each side of the face. Uh, and it is sometimes interpreted by uh, different archaeologists that that is to represent this face of of, of, of Itzamna that is emerging forth from the mouth of death and hell is the creator of both heaven and earth, uh, which, which makes sense in, in the fact that when we talk about the Maya mythology of Itzamna, uh, that Hunabku calls together a council of the gods, Itzamna is there, he, Itzamna, is the one who is referred to as the creator. Where does the, like, so I understand the create, like, the creator, but what would make it seem like it's heaven and earth? Why? Well, because, where does that because we have uh, uh, the, the, the two sides. He is, and, 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 and that, that it is uh, all encompassing, uh, and, and that represents all of creation, uh, both the heaven and the earth. 
All right, now let me tie all of this together. So we see that same imagery all over the place. And, and particularly, some of the strongest and earliest discoveries of that are at a place called Cojon Leash, which is in southern Mexico near the Guatemalan border. And actually, it's actually closer to Belize uh, than Guatemala. Uh, but uh, so at Cojon Leash, we have a temple of the masks there. And there are six depictions of these faces, which, you know, the archaeologists agree, this is a depiction of the, the solar deity or the sun god, Kenich Ahau, Kenich Kin, K-I-N, in Maya, uh, specifically refers to the sun. They use that term in their calendars as well. There is a Kin for in the Hob calendar, uh, but it also refers to the sun. Each actually is referring to face, facial features, and sometimes it is interpreted as, as eyes. Uh, so we have sun, we have face, eyes, and then a how in Maya means Lord or God. Uh, and so that's why they interpret that as Kenich Ahau is the solar deity or the sun god. Most you know, ancient civilizations had a sun god or yeah, representation yeah. of the sun god. But what we're looking at specifically at at uh, at, at, uh, at Cojon Leash is this depiction, the same thing. We got the earth monster, we got the jaguar, we got the face coming out, he's got the spheres underneath his nose, but in his eyes, which are open, we see sunbursts or sun rays uh, depicting, and that's one of the reasons they say, oh, this is clearly Kanisha Hao, this is the sun uh, solar deity, uh, this is the sun god, uh, but uh, but but it, once again, it all ties back to eat some love. We've got these same representations of him all over the place. Is there a body attached to, to this, this Not, face? At huh? Cohon Leash. This okay, just the, and most of these are just, just the, the mask, face. Just the, the, the face. mask, uh, the mask, the face. The, the jaguar is always there. The earth monster is always there. Those square earrings on the side are always there. But we see the sun rays. And once again, another interpretation of the name Kanich Ahau, Keen is sun, each means the face or, or eyes, uh, 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 and, and God. You could interpret that as he whose face face shows the light of the sun, mm. which interestingly enough ties directly into the description that Joseph Smith gave of Jesus Christ himself when he and Oliver Cowdery saw him at the dedication yeah. of the Kirtland, Kirtland Temple, Temple in, in Doctrine and Covenants section 110. Joseph Smith wrote in that, that his eyes were as flame of fire and his countenance shone above the brightness of the sun. I find that very interesting that the Maya were depicting their God in this same type of way, that we see sun in his eyes, we see this, and they tie him directly to the sun. So let's break it down. In. Uh, what's the name of, of the... Kenisha Hau. Kenisha Hau. So kin means sun. Yeah, and each means either, which is I-C-H, means face or eyes or sometimes it's interpreted as eyes, sometimes it's interpreted as face. Uh -huh. And then Ahau? Ahau means Lord or God. Lord or God. So this oh, is the okay. God yeah. whose face shows the light of yeah. the sun. And, 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 and that particular temple where, uh, of the masks at Cojon Leash, the way it's laid out with the six masks, uh, Succo mask, was specifically laid out so that when the setting sun uh, would shine directly on those faces every evening at, at dusk. Wow. When, and, and so it would really illuminate those up. And uh, the, the ruler of that city actually built at Cojon Leash, built his dwelling w uh, even so he could directly look out at those faces from his dwelling place and have that view as the sun was setting to see those. What faces were the other? So what are the other masks uh, that are that are? They're the same depiction. Oh, it's the same. So it's six of six the of same. Six of the exact same depiction. What does six mean in mind? Well, you know that that that's a very good question. What the number six may have represented in numerology, but 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 they had six, and they 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 they, they on different on three different terraces. There's a staircase in the center, and then there are three terraces with, and they get progressively smaller as they get up towards the top. But the details are still the same. Yeah, that's cool. Now, uh, there was a very important discovery that was made uh, in the year 2000 at a site, site called.
called Bacon, which is in the Calakmul Biosphere Reserve in the state of Campeche in Mexico. Now, Bacon, the name itself, that's spelled B-E-C-A-N, it simply means, I've seen it interpreted as water-filled ditch or a moat. Yeah. Uh, there's still a very large moat around the city. Now, and, and, and pretty much every archaeologist agree that, uh, that the site of Bacon goes back at least to the second or third century BC. And, and, and there's still a moat there. You can walk in it. I've walked in it many times. At parts of it are easily 12 to 15 feet deep, mm -hmm. this moat still. There's no water in it anymore, but there was at one time. And, and we also know that not only were, uh, was there a moat, but there were earthen mounds around the outside. So they piled up pills of dirt around the outside, just inside the moat. And there were also pickets of timbers on top of these mounds, exactly as described in the Book of Mormon, how Moroni would defend the Nephite cities. And, and, and they found... Uh, I believe it's seven different entrances into Bacon where there were these bridges across the moats yeah. that would allow people into the city. Oh, okay. So that's kind of interesting, ties directly into the Book of Mormon as far as the description of cities and how they were yeah. defended. That's not the important thing. The important thing is what was found on Structure 10. Uh, at uh, and, and they've got at Bacon, as they have in many sites, sometimes they have specific names. Many of them, the names are given by the Spanish. Like I say, we've got Temple of the Mass, Temple of the Frescoes, Temple of the Descending God, the Castillo, the Nunnery, all in different names that were given, you know, as far as different explorers. But many times they just come in and they say, all right, this is structure number one, this is structure number two. And in this case, at Bacon, pretty much every building has just a number. Yeah. On structure 10, in 2002, we had some archaeology students from a local university notice that on the end of the structure, they could see that there was a wall that looked a different construction technique and was clearly from a different time period from the end of that wall. And some of the students were also able to determine that there was a cavity on the inside. Yeah. So they were able to get permission to tear down the, that particular wall. And what they found on the inside is perhaps the greatest discovery that we've ever made among the Maya world. You know, why do I say that? It's because they found another one of those masks on the inside that is approximately seven to eight feet high uh, from top to bottom. And, and we have the exact same thing, a human face with the breath of life in its nostrils, the eyes are open, we have the earrings, we, and, and, and all of that, and the jaguar and the earth monster. However, there's some very unique things here we have never seen before, and that is pigments. Now, the Maya painted a lot. Pretty much all of their buildings were covered in red pigment. Red was a color of power. It was yeah. very important to them. And most of their structures were covered in red pigments, but you don't see that anymore. There's, you know, because of the exposure to the elements. However, some of the buildings you can still see, oh yeah, there was red paint clearly here at one time, you know, but it, it's pretty much for the large part worn off. When they uncovered this mask at Bacon in 2002, the pigments were still on it, and not just red, but other colors, including Maya blue. Now, Maya blue was a very rare pigment. It was a pigment of the gods. It was difficult to make, mm -hmm. you know, blue pigment among yeah. the Maya, mm -hmm. but they used it in this particular face, and particularly they painted the eyes of this face. They painted them blue, mm -hmm. and. Uh, my uncle, uh, uh, Keith Handy, had a lunch one time with uh, Alfonso Morales, who is one of the most famous uh, archaeologists in Mexico, works for INA, uh, and they were discussing this, this find. And, and Alfonso Morales, he said to, to my uncle Keith, he said, do you know how significant this is? Uh, the Maya never would have dared to paint the color of the eyes of their God unless they had been eyewitnesses to seeing him face to face. That was his own interpretation of what we were seeing there at Bacon. Now that, once again, that's interesting. Which the Maya, they don't have blue eyes. No, if you've ever no, been down there, they don't have exactly. blue eyes. Exactly. 
But these eyes are blue, and you can still see it. Now, uh, once again, uh, what they did once they discovered this mask, they and particularly with the pigments, they're like, oh boy, we got to protect this. And so they built a new structure around it and put a very large plexiglass window in there so people could see it. But then they, 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 they put in instruments to uh, check temperature and humidity, and they'll have students from the local university come in and, and clean it and make sure that you know it's not deteriorating. Uh, and th so there's a locked door on the side, uh, but uh, but those pigments are fading rather rapidly. I mean, I first saw it myself in 2011. Uh, I was there just a couple of months ago in January of this year, and the pigments have faded tremendously, unfortunately. You, if you look closely, you can still see the blue in the eyes, and a lot of the red is still very visible, but they're fading. And, and, and uh, actually, a couple of years ago, once again, they had that plexiglass window, but it was open to sunlight. Uh, and uh, several years ago, they took a vinyl uh, pr uh, printout of it, and they now drape it over the front of the window to keep the sunlight. So you can still look at it. You, there, there's, there, there is a steel bar at the bottom of this uh, a vinyl uh, 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 backdrop that they put in here where you can lift it up and then go underneath the vinyl and take a look through the window. But they've done that to protect it now from the sunlight. So this one, this one still has Earth Monster, Jaguar, bubbles under the nose. It does, and, and the earrings. But here is the most important part, and this is the part that people miss. And the reason why is because that structure that they built around it does not give you very much room to get back and take a look at the full picture. And that is, there is a, there are hands down at the bottom, and there are legs and feet up at the top. This is a very clear depiction of the descending God. Oh, yes. And, and, and so this is what that tells me is these depictions are not as sometimes noted separate uh, Maya, gods or separate or separate or Maya King, you know, who is kind of somewhat impersonating a God. The fact that he's got his hands down at the bottom and legs and feet up in the air says this is to the descending God. There's no Maya King that would dare impersonate their God in that way. Yeah. And, and so uh, that then ties it all together, all of this imagery we are seeing of Kenichi Hao, the masks, the stucco masks that go all the way down, even into Honduras. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, these are depictions of the descending god. So those cr the critics who are saying you only find the descending god at Tulum, it's not true. Yeah. It's everywhere. So that was found in in in, in 2002, and I and 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 I, I'm going to send you the picture yes. so you can show on this video uh, the of the full exactly the full mass with the full body, so you can see the hands down below and the legs up in the air because it's oftentimes missed. I had to stitch that together in Photoshop. We had to take that in two pictures. We couldn't do. We didn't have a panorama camera back then when we got the picture. So so we stitched together in Photoshop. But once you see the whole thing, it's very clear. You're like, wow, this is the descending God. And, and, and this dates back all the way at least to possibly 150, 200 AD when this was created. That's right, there, during that at, time of peace. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and so, uh, it, but, but it ties all of that together. Now, that was the first one that we have seen. And that's why I said it's so important, that discovery, because it ties all of those masks mm -hmm. together that this is the descending God. Yeah. Kanicha Hao is the, the descending, descending God. God. Uh, it, Itzam Na is the descending God. It ties it all together. But now we've even found another one. Oh, really? Uh, and so, yes. And, and that was a recent discovery. How there, recent? Uh, in the last... Uh, probably 18 months, mm -hmm. there is an archaeological dig in northern Guatemala called El Zotz, uh, refers Zotz. to the bat, Zotz, Z-O-T-Z. Okay. And it's an active archaeological dig. Uh, it's very difficult to get there. Uh, it's not open to tourists yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, 
they'd have to build roads to get in there. I mean, it's, 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 it's a difficult trek. Mm -hmm. It's very remote to get in there. And um, we're going to go there. We're going to go oh, there. Oh, yeah, there you go. So but you're taking us. Yeah, though, absolutely. So. <laughs> uh, but they've been finding new things there all the time. And one of, and they're finding these masks, these same mascaronas, the same faces there. But one of them and I'm going to send you this picture so you can show on the video, too, from El Zotz. They have one of these masks with the hands down below and the feet up in the air once again. Another bubbles, bubble. every, yes, everything. every the spheres uh, for the puffs of air. Earthen it's all there. Jaguar. It's all there, wow. and it's at El Zotz. Oh, and yeah. so once again, it's this is further strong evidence emphasizing this is the, the parallels are crazy. Oh yes, it's, absolutely, it's beautiful. So we we don't have much more time because I know you have to go at, at two yeah. o'clock. So I, I do before because at the end we're gonna do we're gonna throw some hardball questions at you sure. too because you know that's what people want to hear, but. But before there, I want you to talk a little bit in our discussion that we had before, you talked a little bit about the importance of dates when it comes to the Maya and how dates kind of play a role, especially at Tulum. Um, and then maybe let's talk a little bit about Chichen Itza and we'll kind yeah, of wrap yeah, absolutely. this all up. Yeah, Chichen Itza dates to the 8th and 9th centuries, and, and, and pretty much everybody's familiar with the large Castillo there. As a matter of fact, I got a picture of it right here, uh, where we have the large Castillo right here, the large castle, uh, and or uh, this is properly known as the Temple of Kukulkan. Uh, and, and the feathered serpent, hence this artist's interpretation of what kind of looks like a dragon, uh -huh. you know, because he's a feathered serpent. Snakes don't have feathers, yeah. but Kukulkan does because and so he can hence he's fly. Exactly. Uh, it, it, the same. It, once again, it's the same name as Quetzalcoatl among, you know, the Aztec. Exactly. Uh, the, the feathered serpent. This is the temple of Kukulkan. We have what we have here is we have nine terraces on this temple, and we've got four staircases on each side. Each staircase has exactly 91 steps. There's no variance. In, uh, so each side, 91. Four times 91 is 364. The top step at the top, the one that's in common, is makes 365, which once again ties into Such the calendar. Such attention to detail. That's oh, crazy. Yeah. It's <laughs> wild. This building, which is referred to as one of the seven modern wonders of the world, is an engineering marvel yeah. uh, for many different reasons. That yeah, the fact that they could get it all even and get 91 steps exactly on each side is yeah. you know it shows you know how precise they were and how um, important that was. Right. But even more so... And the heads had to roll 91 times. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, there's not a lot of yeah, evidence of, of human sacrifice yeah. among the Maya. But we the know, Aztecs. Yeah, the actually, Aztecs yeah. definitely have... And this is, a, this is a Mayan structure. Yes, it yeah. is. Yes, it is. And and so... And uh, what are the nine... Do the nine levels, do they have any significance? Yes, absolutely. Nine among the Maya was another representation in numerology of the underworld. Mm. And, and so what we have here, once again, these nine terraces and then the four staircases. Now, one of the staircases is different. 91 steps on each side, on each four sides, but on one side in particular, and it's depicted here in this, this artist representation, is that there are heads of... Serpent of the serpent, uh, specifically Kukulkan. We know it's Kukulkan for a couple of different reasons. One is that uh, uh, he's got feathers instead of scales on, on the head at the base. And uh, we also have three dots, uh, Maya dots, uh, above the eyes, which you know, in numerology, and pretty much every ancient color numeral, uh, uh, culture of numerology, it, it represents God. You know, what we, you know, in Christianity, we refer to as the Trinity or the Godhead. Yeah, number three represents God. And, and so we had the three uh, dots above the eyes. And then we also have the Maya symbol of a caracal coming out the corners of its mouth. A caracal looks like a little spiral. It represented to the Maya eternal life. Mm -hmm. So what we, and then what we have here is once again, we have it on either side of the staircase, the two heads of the serpents. And then up at the top, there are two tails of the serpent. Okay. Now, what makes this site so specifically famous is the effect of light and shadow that takes place 
uh, on that. And, and it, it, it is popularly uh, interpreted as the spring equinox, you know, on March 21st. Uh, uh, Chichen Itza, the archaeological site itself, closes every day, you know, around five o'clock, you know, well before, you know, the sun sets. But on March 21st, they let people into the site late so that they can see the effect of light and shadow. Because as the sun is setting on this particular staircase, you get these terraces that cast shadows on the edge of the staircase, which connects the light. The, 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 the light of the sun still illuminates the head of the snake. And then because of the way the triangles from these terraces, it makes it look like the snake is undulating, exactly. going back and forth. And then the light actually connects to the tail at the top. So you have this illuminated image of a serpent that goes from the head all the way on the side of the staircase, all the way up to the top. And, and, and we like, make such boring buildings these days. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. We're, we're not thinking, thinking about, about that, that sort of stuff. stuff. Like I love, one of my favorite parts about ancient civilizations is their obsession with kind of the cosmos and the sun yes. and the light, the seasons, and how they in, they put all of that into their buildings. Oh, right, right, right. We could talk about, you know, sacred geometry and sacred architecture among the Maya because they aligned many of their buildings with the heavens, with the stars, uh, with different constellations. All, all, all those types of things were important to the Maya. But this effective light and shadow, to pull this off, required some serious understanding, uh, yeah, uh, 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 of uh, astronomy, of uh, engineering, mathematics, all of those things to be able to pull this off. It was an engineering uh, marvel, you know, to be able to do that. Now, when you go there on March 21st, uh, you, uh, as they say, it, oh, it's clearly marking the spring equinox. The thing is, remember how many terraces we have here? We've got nine. However, on the side of the staircase, we only see seven shadows from those terraces. Uh, and But there's nine of them. Is there a day where we see all nine shadows on the edge of the staircase? Yes, yes we do. Okay. You know what I'm gonna say, it's on April 6th. And that is very well documented that you can see all nine terraces shadows cast on this staircase on April 6th. It's April 6th, for those who aren't Latter-day Saints who may be watching it, this is, this is a very important date to us because it's that's when the, the, the church was restored, right? It was on April 6th. But the reason why it was restored on that day as well is because we believe that that's the day of the birth of Christ. Right. Right. And, and, and the, the great Mayanist Michael Coe, who was very prolific in his writing, who was... And hates the Book of Mormon. He does. <laughs> he does. He was not a member of the church, and he was, he was a critic of the Book of Mormon, and he didn't like it when people tied Mayan archaeological evidence to, to the Book of Mormon. But he even said in one of his writings that the Maya identified their gods by the day that they were born. Mm -hmm. And and so if this is indeed this effect of light and shadow is marking April 6, it could be indicating that the Maya were indicating that Kukulkan was born on April 6. So what's but what's up with the serpent? Well, yeah. Okay. Let's get well, into that. Yeah, cuz that's all, usually the symbol of the, the devil, devil, right? right. That's, well, all, that's what we exactly. say. Exactly. I mean, in, in the Western civilization, in, in, in our modern day and age, when we look at the symbol of the serpent, yeah, we think of Genesis and we think of the serpent as a, a symbol of evil. However, it certainly wasn't always that way and definitely not among ancient cultures. I mean, think of the story of Moses in the wilderness when they had yeah, that fiery serpents me. come among the children of Israel and, and Moses created a brazen or brass serpent, which he put on a pole and told the people to look to it and live. And we commonly understand that that was an early symbol of Christ. And it says that in the Book of Mormon. It sure, sure does. Right? It's yes, very it does. clearly. It's type, yeah. In it's the Book of Helaman. Uh -huh. In the Book of Helaman, exactly, and and he mentioned that you know that not only had Moses testified of these things, but uh, all the prophets had as yeah. well. So we know that that symbol of the serpent was a symbol, uh, at least in in part, among the ancient Israel as a symbol of Christ, because it wasn't the ser brass serpent that was saving them. They didn't believe in idolatry. Yeah. You know, I mean, they, they started going down a path of idolatry, and Moses brings them back, reigns them back in, you know, but the, the thing is, is that it was a symbol of Christ who would be held up, who would be raised up 
to, to save all mankind. And so, so for us, in, in, in a modern sense, the image of a snake or a serpent doesn't seem to fit. But we have to think as ancient as people ancient. would have. We have to understand that while the symbology didn't make, doesn't make sense, clear sense to us, it would have to them. Now, to, to finish off this symbology, now, the, you know, I've heard, you know, I've been to Chichen Itza many times and I hear the local tour guides, which, you know, uh, are, are telling people, well, this is Kukul Khan, you know, he's d clearly descending down. To, and once again, imagery of descending, mm -hmm. a snake coming down, yeah. you know, uh, and, and he's telling the people, March 21st, it's time to plant. You know, uh, and it's planting season, which doesn't really make sense, you know, because the Yucatan is very... very you can plant, plant all year long. Right, right. <laughs> it's a very temperate... Now, the Yucatan Peninsula, the, uh, you know, they Mesoamerica... Have a rainy season. Yeah, yeah, it has a rainy season, it has a dry season, but but the temperatures range pretty much from 70 degrees Fahrenheit up to the mid-90s, pretty much all year round. And and so you, when can you plant? Well, pretty much any time, as long as you can get sufficient irrigation. And yeah. in the Maya, we're very good at irrigation, you know, uh, and, and planting crops and things like that. So, but why would they build a temple like this just to tell people it's time to start planting? Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. No, you know, so, it, so they could set their clocks back because right. it was uh, a <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. daylight savings. <laughs> Took up decades to build this. Because they kept forgetting and it, right. it was messing up. Oh, we need to build something <laughs> to remind us to set our clocks back. Right. Because they kept being late to church. And, and, and here's, <laughs> absolutely. And here's something to think about, too. The Maya built this. It took them decades, and they built it without slave labor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they, I mean, these are even more impressive than you know the the pyramids yeah. of Egypt. Mm -hmm. You know, with, particularly with these effect of light and shadow that you get. But what are they trying to say really here? Yeah, this is Kukul Khan, that and and he's descending through. What does the nine mean? The oh, underworld. Right. He's right. descending through all the levels of the underworld. They believe there were nine levels mm -hmm. of the underworld. That's why the number nine represented the underworld. Because yeah. there are nine levels of the underworld. He's descending through it. Remember what I told you what's here on the base of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the serpent head? There's like that. Caracal. The caracal, yeah, yeah. The Represented eternal life. Okay. Kukul Khan is descending through the underworld, speaking the words of eternal life. Mm. And and that he descended below all things, right? Right. We, we know that absolutely. Yeah. This is a symbol worth building a large temple for. Yeah. To de de to declare that Kukul Khan Itzamna, the descending God, who we refer to as Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. descended below all things. He's speaking the words of eternal life to all creatures. No matter which level you are in, he is speaking those words of eternal life. And as I mentioned, that is something worth building a monument like this. Okay, so you're saying Michael Coe talks about how they represent their gods by the date that they were born, right? So and, April 6th. And 6th, men as well, and, both and gods men and well. men. And uh -huh. we do that in our society. Everyone's sure. identified by their birthday. Yes. You know? Is there any other instance where that April 6th date plays a role and connects in to the, the descending god or anything like that? Well, yeah, I mean, we see similar effects of light and shadow uh, at Tulum. Okay. At the descent. As a matter of fact, uh, on April 6th, uh, in the early morning hours before the sun rises at uh -huh. Tulum, the planet Venus aligns perfectly with the temple of the descending God right wow. over the main right doorway. The so if you're standing in Tulum, facing east yeah. towards the temple of the descending God on April 6th, and it's a clear day, you will see the planet Venus, a very bright star, yeah. the morning and evening star, as mm -hmm. it's referred to, yeah. uh, directly over the main entrance of the doorway of the temple of the descending wow. God. What the heck, dude? <laughs> yeah. And Venus, like, it's a representation of Christ. Absolutely. Multiple times, like, especially in Europe. I Think of the that. book of Revelations. Uh -huh. The yeah. book of Revelations equates Christ, because it refers to him as, 
you know, the, the, the I mean, sometimes we refer the to it as the, the morning. yeah, the evening and morning star, the load star, the day star, because you can see it during the daylight hours. So it's bright. the brightest star. I mean, it's really a planet, yeah. but it's the brightest star in our night sky. And you can even see it during the daytime. And because Christ is the light of the world, hence that connection to mm -hmm. Venus, which the Maya had a very strong connection with Venus. They tied, there are many things that they, they had specific symbols that represented Venus, and they tracked Venus. Many of their buildings were aligned with Venus and its azimuth and its its path that it would take through the sky. And so, so yeah, that's another... Uh, April 6th. Uh, April 6th. It lines up yes. with the Temple of the Descending God. Exactly. Which is another <laughs> reason why... It's crazy. Ukul Khan at Chichen Itza with April 6th and, the, and, and you see the full effect of like a shower. It connects it together, yeah. Right, exactly. Connects to the Descending God at Tulum. Oh See, all of these symbols do connect together, and we're only beginning it's to so understand beautiful. that. And it's so beautiful because, like, when you when you think about it, and why I love the work that you guys have done, and we're gonna get into your full geographical uh, theory one day, where we want to set up another one, and we'll and we'll do some hardball questions in regard to that. But, but the reason I love this work is because. You know, in the Book of Mormon, in the introduction, it says that the crowning event is when Jesus Christ visits the Americas. And if there's one thing that would echo through time from the whole Book of Mormon, would it not be that? Absolutely. And that's what you guys are tying together. And so exactly. you have, you know, these multiple depictions of, of what you're saying is Christ, but it's just an echo of one event and it's been interpreted throughout the years as there's, you know, dissemination and, and you know, difference of times between groups as they travel around and stuff. And so, yeah, and this is just scratching the surface, yeah. too. I mean, there are many other uh, depictions that we can tie in, including, you know, uh, talking about Itzapa, mm -hmm. you know, which is, uh, you know, is many people refer to as the birthplace of the Maya civilization. People know that the people lived there were not Maya, mm -hmm. but... Uh, from Itzapa, around 550 BC, you have emanating the, the, the first mentions and worship of Itzamna came from that point. Mm -hmm. The Maya calendar came out of there, the Maya number system, understandings of mathematics and geometry and, and architecture and engineering. A lot of that also came out of Itzapa, and there are connections and tie-ins to the resurrection and uh, of of Itzamna and 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 his conquering of death and hell uh -huh. there at Itzapa as well. But that's that's another story for another yeah, time. So much to get yeah, into. I know. But... So I I have two questions that uh, anyone who may be critical to the Central American theory may be being like, hey, ask a question about this. Now we didn't talk a lot, and I'm not going to ask random questions because. Like I said, we want to get into the, your actual theory of the Yucatan Peninsula and the Book of Mormon geography. But there's two things that you mentioned specifically. One is calendars. We talked about calendars a lot in this conversation. So one, one thing that a critic would point out is, oh, that someone who maybe believes that the Book of Mormon happened in North America, they're like, well, the Jews are on a moon calendar and they, the Native Americans have always been on a moon calendar. But it seems like that the Maya, the Aztecs, they're very much on a sun calendar and they, they, their calendar system circles around the sun. What are your thoughts on that? Is that just kind of like, because I mean, no theory is perfect, right? Because there's always little things. What, what would you say to someone who would point that out? Well, I mean, I mean, obviously, every culture in, is going to have different ways of tracking time. Uh -huh. uh, the Maya, as I mentioned, the origins of the Maya calendar. I mean, they and they had s several different calendars. I mean, they had a, a sacred calendar. They have a Hob calendar. They have this. Well, the Sulkin is okay. their sacred calendar. Then they have, uh, you know, a calendar, a long count calendar that can accurately predict dates. Uh, you know, in both in the the future and the past, and you know, the, in 2012, the Maya calendar did not run out. You know, mm -hmm. what, there's a common misunderstanding. Everyone's like, oh, 
oh, the Mayan calendar is coming to an end. Yeah. Uh, what had happened was it was the end of uh, the uh, uh, end of the uh, 13th Baktun, mm -hmm. uh, at, w which is a 400 year period, period. of time uh -huh. among the Maya. Uh, but uh, but it's clear they had. Uh, you know, and, and it largely had to do with their understanding of, of mathematics and number systems. Mm -hmm. The Maya understood the concept of zero. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, I mentioned they had a base 20 number system, and, and that enabled them to make more precise calculations. Uh, and, and, and a lot of that, as I mentioned, centered out of Itzapa. It's pretty clear that happened through cultural diffusion. Mm -hmm. You know, ancient archaeologists, or I mean, archaeologists don't really understand completely who the people were at yeah. Itzapa. They know they weren't Maya. Mm -hmm. They knew they came among the Maya and then greatly influenced Influence. them. Okay. And, and, and so, but they had this, uh, and, and from there it was developed, and li lar largely it was understanding that the, the, the Itzapans had combined with knowledge that the Maya had mm -hmm. that brought about a, a new calendar system that was uh -huh. used. Do you, and moved. Yeah, so here's a question. Do the Egyptians, do you know if they were on a sun calendar or a moon calendar? I, I can't answer that question. Let's ask Siri real quick. Did the Egyptians work off of a sun calendar or a moon calendar? Ancient Egypt, solar year. I think that they. I think they, it's I mean, it was likely. I mean, they they had strong like for example, Ra is the sun god among the uh, the ancient Egyptians. Yeah. You know, so I mean, so likely. yeah. But what I'm saying is like it's just it's just interesting because there's there's two different main cultures that Lehi and his family come from, right? There's they they came from an Egyptian background because they're from the tribe of Manasseh, and that yeah. very much ran through their their blood. They spoke Egyptian, obviously. They wrote in Egyptian. But then they were trained after the manner of the Jews, right? So you have like these two competing things. And so that's why it's hard when you're trying to nail things down, specifically with calendars and things like that. Because like I said, I don't know exactly if the Egyptians use a solar or a lunar. Um, but that's just one of the, com the, the co complex things. Um, now, so next question. So obviously you're a proponent of the Central American theory. Right. Oh, yes. As I mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, our quest is to look for, I mean, that if, if once again, 3rd Nephi chapter 11 is the crowning event of the Book of Mormon, there has to be some kind of archaeological evidence that supports that. Mm -hmm. So we are specifically looking for evidences of Christ mm -hmm. that support the testimony of the Book of Mormon, and we'll go wherever that mm -hmm. takes us. Yes. From, from our research and our perspective, what we're looking at, we're finding that in Mesoamerica, mm -hmm. and, and not really really anywhere else. Yeah. And and so do, do we have ideas on a model of, and geography goes along with that? Absolutely. But that's not our primary sure. focus. Do you hold as a possibility that Christ could have visited Central America, but that the Book of Mormon maybe took place somewhere else? We're not really seeing that. Yeah. I mean, because everything, you know, one of the things I mentioned earlier is the... Uh, uh, is the sock bays or roads, uh, which are almost exactly the way that they were described in the Book of Mormon, that they were cast up. These sock bays are a good, I've walked down many of them in the Yucatan, and uh, they're a good 18 inches, inches off. off the ground. I mean, if that's not a description of cast up, I don't know mm -hmm. what is, where they would form a rock bed mm -hmm. and then they would line it with cement and plaster. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's amazing how they've survived even All to this years. day. Uh, and they had thousands of miles of and these so roads. there's there's tons of other archaeological evidences that you would tie oh, oh, to. Oh, yeah. And so, and the, the, the usage of mm -hmm. cement. Mm -hmm. You know, the Maya invented mm -hmm hydraulic cement yeah. long before it was ever developed in Europe, okay. uh, where they, uh, and, and it was largely because of the amount of limestone that is available there. I mean, mm -hmm. to create cement, you've got to you know, create a limestone powder, grind mm -hmm. limestone, which is relatively soft, yeah. into a powder, then you've got to heat it up in a kiln, you know, mm -hmm. to a very high temperature, and then mix it with gravel uh, and rock, mm -hmm. and then when you add water to that, you can mm -hmm. uh, create concrete. And 
and and this and the, the Maya invented that process. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why their temples are still a, around. And they use a technique that is known as cast in place concrete. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, most of their temples they would carve out of solid limestone. Mm -hmm. They'd put up scaffolding mm -hmm. and then uh, and then line the outside with solid limestone, and then they would fill the center with their cast in place concrete. Yeah. So one of the reasons why those temples are still there today. For sure. In the, in the Book of Helaman, uh, you know, they mentioned several times how the people, in part due to the lack of timber mm -hmm. at that time, yeah. uh, they they would create buildings out of and homes mm -hmm. out of cement, yeah. which matches exactly what the Maya described. Uh -huh. Yeah. So going going off that right there, one one someone who would be who would be critical to the Central American theory, they would say, well, in Deuteronomy, Leviticus, it talks specifically how. Uh, the Jews should not, whenever they're making something out of stone, they should not uh, cut it, right? And then also that there should be no steps up to their temple, which all of the temples down south have steps that lead up to them, right? And so what, because uh, I would say we talked to Wayne May, and he's obviously a proponent of the Heartland Theory, and he talks about how in many of these, you know, mound builder sites, there are ramps that are built up to these temple spots where they didn't use steps, and so it matches a little bit more there. What are your thoughts on that? Well, first, you, first of all, we've got, I mean, a, a lot of, uh, of, as I mentioned, cultural diffusion. I yeah. mean, the Maya... Uh, I mean, what we're talking about and what we're believing is that the Lehites, Lehi mm -hmm. yeah. and his children and those who came, Zoram, others who came with them, they, they, they came and already found a land that was populated mm -hmm. with thousands, if not millions of people already, and mm -hmm. specifically the Maya, and they lived among, among them, them okay. among the Maya. And there are evidences, and many people have addressed so this. So the claim isn't that the Maya are the Nephites? Oh, definitely no. not. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. That makes definitely sense. not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, to, to assume that the Maya were the Nephites or the Lamanites is, is, is an assumption that should not be made. Yeah, the Maya have been here far longer than 600 BC, mm -hmm. but they were primarily a hunter-gatherer society. They, they changed rapidly overnight to these, the, you know, with their science, uh, uh, understanding of mathematics and num uh, number systems and, and engineering and writing to, uh, well. to start and writing to building these massive temples that we see. I mean, uh, they, they weren't always that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and so clearly a lot of cultural diffusion took place mm -hmm. and, and that could include changes to what you know, uh, what ancient Israel would believe as far as you know, mm -hmm. following the law of Moses yeah, yeah. or following uh, ancient traditions, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, you know, uh, so, so things change yeah, over yeah. time, mm -hmm. and the fact that you know that uh, somebody may have not felt like they could build steps mm -hmm. or carve out of solid stone that that's definitely going to change. I mean, we yeah. even see that in mm -hmm. modern. LDS culture. And, and has here's the changed. thing, too. You know, if the Maya is an existing civilization, the Nephites somewhat assimilate, but they probably stay separate to some degree. And, and maybe there are other temples that maybe would fit that. Like, the, the, the thing is, is like there's a big question mark. And as we've talked to a lot of people, and, uh, you know, I, I'm super excited to set up another time where we can dig into your, your theory because I, I really like the Yucatan Peninsula theory where the northern land's a tip of the Yucatan. Like, it's very interesting, and I want to get into all of that because a lot I think of compelling there's a lot evidence. of, you know, yeah. compelling stuff. But I, I think the point is, and where I or maybe we can wrap up here, is, you know, the thing that's amazing is that the center of the Book of Mormon, which is being focused on here, is is Jesus Christ. And, you know, even in, in North America, there are oral traditions of a Christ-like figure coming and visiting. And that's a central message of the Book of Mormon, right? It's that Christ, he visited multiple places around the world. He showed himself that he is the Savior of the world. And I, I just think that is beautiful. And so I, I appreciate the work that your uncle, your aunt, and you have done in bringing these amazing evidences to life. And it strengthened my faith in Christ. And uh, I want to leave it to you to uh, share your testimony of Christ and the Book of Mormon. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up there. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so th this has been a very important, I want to say in part passion uh, in doing this research because we love the Book of Mormon so much. 
uh, uh, but but also we feel it as a spiritual journey. And you talked about storytelling earlier. Uh, the way that my uncle wrote the book, uh, Finding Christ While on the Trail of the Free Brothers, it's not a scholarly book. It's very approachable. Now, it it, 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 it's well documented, and, 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 and it, we've got footnotes and references throughout the book. There's a huge section that's, that's backing up all of the claims that are being made, and there's lots of scholarly claims, but the book's not told in that way. It's not a textbook. Mm -hmm. It's told from uh, uh, a, a narrative perspective, primarily from the experience of my uncle Keith and his wife Karma and their daughters as they have been on this journey. This, the subtitle of the book is our journey of faith mm -hmm. and 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 that's really what it's been for our entire family as we have been seeing these evidences of Christ and 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 really what we want to do here is very much what Joseph Smith said when he first saw uh, modern, uh, discoveries of the uh, of the ancient sites in Mesoamerica. He was sent uh, by John Bernheisel a copy of Incidents of Travel in the Yucatan and Chiapas, the books written by Stevens and Catherwood as they were exploring in the 1830s. And Stevens the explorer and then Catherwood the artist painted these uh, beautiful watercolors of the ruins that they had seen. Joseph Smith went through the book with great interest and wrote a letter back to John Bernheisel, and he thanked him for the book. And he said in that letter that these archeological discoveries would support the testimony of the Book of Mormon. So what we are trying to do is to help these evidences, these archaeological discoveries are not going to give anybody a testimony. It's not going to convince anyone mm -hmm. of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. What we have seen and what we've talked about in the last little bit here is just scratching the surface of some of the things that we have seen that make a Mesoamerican setting for the Book of Mormon incredibly plausible. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't prove anything, but it makes it very, very plausible. Yeah. But what I want people to see is that it will take an, ex an existing spiritual witness of the Book of Mormon that they have already received and validate that testimony to know that these people in the Book of Mormon, this just wasn't an allegory. It wasn't just nice stories written about Christ. Uh, these were real people who lived on this continent who had real lives and real struggles and had real faith. And they left behind evidences of their testimonies in stone so that today we can still hear those testimonies. Much like the Book of Mormon itself is a voice as if speaking from the dust, the, archaeolo uh, the archaeological evidences left behind are also speaking to us from the dust to testify that these were real people who not only had faith in Christ, but many of them were eyewitnesses too, and who knew him personally and left those, those, those testimonies behind in stone. So it is my personal witness that I know that the Book of Mormon really took place. It was, it is a historical and spiritual record of people who really lived on this continent, and they testified that Jesus is the Christ, and that he visited them, that he lived among them, that he healed their sick and their dead, and that he bore testimony that he was the light and the life of the world and that he had drunken out of that bitter cup, that he had conquered death and hell. And to me, it is seeing these archeological evidences of Christ and his resurrection further strengthen my own spiritual witness that Jesus does live today, that Joseph Smith did see him, not only in the grove of trees, but, and also in the Kirtland temple, but many other occasions, 
and, and, and that the Book of Mormon that was translated by Joseph Smith was done so by the gift and power of God for our day as a testimony to the world that God still loves his people and that he wants them to hear his word and to come unto Christ. And the Book of Mormon is the vehicle to do that in conjunction with the Bible and other testimonies of him. And that is my witness, which I leave with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you. Mike, thank you so much. I think this is why we were so intrigued the first time we met with you is because your mission is very similar to ours in not only wanting to bolster those who already have a testimony, uh, bolster their faith, but to inspire curiosity for those that have not yet found that to seek it out because it is very, very plausible that all of these things indeed did occur. And we're, we're grateful for the work that you've done and um, for wanting to share it with the world. That's so awesome. Yeah. Buy this book. It's in, it, it's in the description. And uh, the research on the descending God and everything is, is in here. And uh, people can do their own study. Yeah. So, all right. Thank you for watching.